Uh, and now I'm honored to invite our uh, last and uh, next speaker, Sharon Aloni Cunio. Sharon and her almost four years old twin daughters, Emma and Julie, were released from captivity after 52 days. Her sister Danielle was also released along with her daughter Emilia. Her husband David Cunio and his brother Ariel Cunio are still in Hamas captivity. Thank you, Sharon, for joining us. Toda Sharon. Thank you, first of all, for having me here and uh, listening to my story. I will tell you a little bit shortly about what happened to us on October 7th. Uh, it all began at 6 a.m., 6.30 in the morning, when we had the missile alerts coming out strongly, like we never heard it before. We went into the safe room, along with my sister and my nephew, who came to visit us for a Simchat Torah weekend. A while after, around 7.15, we got a message that there are terrorists inside the kibbutz dressed as soldiers and that we should get inside the safe room and hold the doors and not open to anyone. Messages uh, started to come from everyone on the kibbutz saying that they're in my house, in my house, in my house. And then we began to hear about people getting shot, uh, houses being burned. And we only could wish for that they won't arrive to our house. A while afterwards, um, they came into our neighbor's house. We were texting along with my family the whole time. My parents who lives uh, in the center of Israel were stressed. They didn't know what happened. We just told them there are crazy amount of terrorists inside the kibbutz. In Iroz alone, there were a few hundreds of terrorists without any army that came up until all the terrorists and all the people from Gaza has left the kibbutz. The army got there only by two. At around 10, they enter our house, they broke in. We started to hear them screaming in Arabic. Um, they were shouting, Allahu Akbar. And then they got into the safe room and they tried to open the door, forced force to open the door. Um, my husband battled with them after he already held the door since 6 a 6 30 a.m. because the doors of the safe room are not built in order to prevent someone from coming in, only from missiles. At that point, they began to open a bit the handle of the door. He screamed at me to come and help him. I jumped on the door and helped him and they fought with us for several minutes. And then they gave up. They cut off the electricity. <clears throat> so we didn't have any air or any light. And then a um, few minutes later, they started lighting something up. They started burning our house down in order to, they wanted just to suffocate us to death. At that point, we later on learned that they opened the gas and the house was burned down to the ground. At that point, all the smoke started to get inside, inside the safe room. And I told my husband that <clears throat> we have no other choice, but we have to open the window and climb out. He went out first with our daughter, one of the twins, Julie. We watched three of our cars just being burnt and we didn't even understood the amount of terrorists inside the kibbutz because our house is first line to the fence towards Gaza. I saw terrorists coming nearby. I told them, grab the girl and run away and close the window. Afterwards, we opened the window again, and there were um, there was a terrorist outside the window pointing with a Kalachnikov at me. I screamed at my sister to close the door, to close the window, and he took he took two shots to the iron window. And I think at that point, I understood that we are about to suffocate to death. 
Amelia, my niece, started screaming that she can't breathe. Emma was choking. She couldn't stop um, coughing. She's asthmatic. And I think at that point I gave up and I passed out. Danielle, my sister, didn't want to die like this. So she told me, she, she shook me and woke me up and told me, open the window so they will shoot us because it will be painful but faster than to suffocate slowly to death. We opened the window and we waited for them to shoot us. There were five or six of them outside with their weapons. They dragged me out first. I fell down to the ground because I was half conscious. And they took everyone out. And one of them just dragged me on my knees when I'm half conscious. And at that point, I understood that he was going to rape me and kill me. And at that time, they took my sister, my niece, and my other twin, Emma, to a different place. They separated us. When the terrorist dragged me, he dragged me towards the fields and to, I don't know how to say it, thankfully, he dragged me towards the car that my husband and my daughter were taking on. They caught them in our neighbor's house. He yelled at them, this is my wife. And they marked the terrorist to come and bring me to them. I think this is the only reason why I didn't get raped and killed. When they took us to Gaza, um, we were there were three of us, me, my husband, David, and one of our twin daughters, Yuli. We were held at a house of a family, not innocent family. The conditions were terrible. We're not allowed to leave the room. We had two armed terrorists guarding us 24-7. I almost lost my mind thinking, where is Emma? Where is my daughter? I kept asking them to give me answer. Where is my daughter? They didn't know. Um, after nine days, the house next to us was bombed. The wall came tumbling at us, coming down at us. And they decided to move us to a different place. The next day, they wanted to do a video of us to the elderly. So they told me to put on the hijab. And I started hearing um, sounds of crying, of a baby crying. And I said, I held David and I told him, it's Emma. And he told me, you're losing your mind. Why, why would she be here? And then... The crying got louder, and someone came into the room, handing me Emma. After 10 days, she was alone, with not, not with my sister, by herself, at a Gazan house, with no ability to speak with someone, because no one spoke their Hebrew. They didn't give her a pacifier. They changed her diaper once a day. They didn't... Uh, showered her. They gave her barely food. She didn't sleep. She slept on the floor. Three. She was when when she was when we were kidnapped. They were three three years and three months old. And at that point, we all of us have been together. And I started asking Emma, "Where is uh, Danielle and Amelia?" And the only the only thing she said was when they were kidnapped, the men spilled in red, a sentence that I will, could, I will never forget. Later on, after our release, I found out that when they took Danielle, Emilia, and Emma out of the window, they took them alone to Gaza. They upload they loaded on the truck a dying Israeli soldier, which had died on the truck, and all of his blood came down on the girl's legs. We were all taking with our pajamas barefoot. And once they got into Gaza Strip, 
some guy um, came and took Emma from my sister's hands. And when she st started to shout at him and scream at him that this is her daughter, as far as he knows, he just pointed a gun at her and signaled her to sit down. And they took her to the tunnels. And we have a missing period of 10 days, which we don't know what she has been through. Three years old girl. Um, three days prior to our release, they separated the V from us, my husband. They told us that there are, there's a deal coming up and only women and children are allowed to be released. They took him down to the tunnels. And as far as the end of November, we have no information whatsoever about him, about his condition, about where he is right now. Um, the conditions there were awful. Every day is filled with despair, filled with fear of being killed, of being raped, of just thinking that everyone gave up on you. And I was released with my girls after 52 days. My husband has been there for over 150 days. Three times the time, the amount of time that we were there. I can't even imagine what is his condition right now. The, the not even physical terror, but the mental terror, the psychological terror that they used, they let us, they really let us believe that no one cares about us as and as the days went by when we saw that it's not happening after a day or two and we're still here something really came to i really started to believe that we're staying here that we are not getting out and i can't even explain to you the conditions we were held in, we were 12 people in one room. We weren't allowed to come out of the room only for the bathroom and you had to knock in order to go out. You don't know if they will open to you after two minutes or two hours. I have two little girls who had to pee and poop in the sink and in the trash can because I can't take them in time to the bathroom. The hearing the bombing outside, the electricity that a lot of times were disconnected, the humidity, the heat, the food, we had moldy pita and cheese, a little cheese. I lost 22 pounds in 52 days. And I always say that from November 24th, the day that they took my husband away from me, I am an empty shell. We lost everything. Our house was completely burned down. We, we lost, I have no memory, nothing to hold on to from my husband. They took our rings when we got into Aza. And my girls keep asking me every day, why don't they bring daddy back? And I have to tell them because the people in Gaza still haven't decided that it's his turn. And it is a very difficult thing to say to a three and a half year old girls, they just want their dad back. We have no house. We have, we st we're staying at my parents' place because I can't handle anything alone. I'm an empty shell. I'm depressed. I'm trying to be strong for my girls. But as the day goes on, it's getting worse. And I don't know where I can keep on praying or have hope to see them back if the world wouldn't help us to do so. Because people are starting to get used to the fact that there are hostages in Aza. People that 
say that October 7th never happened. And I'm the life proof of that. I'm the living proof of that. People, they're saying that we are liars, that we just came forward to talk about it a month after our release, when we weren't even able to speak loudly because we always have to whisper during captivity. So I am here today begging you to do everything you can, talk to everyone you know, because they are suffocating to death in those tunnels. They are being molested. They are being raped, both women and men as well, as we know. I don't want to get a video that Hamas is informing me that my husband was killed. He doesn't deserve it. None of them deserve it. We were only people. We are only civilians that just spend the time during the holidays. And since then, we almost had four holidays since October 7th. We are about to celebrate Passover next month, the holiday of freedom. How can I celebrate any freedom when they are still there? So please contact everyone, you know, everyone who has the little influence in order to share our stories, share our suffering. I promised my husband when we were separated that I will do anything from him and I will fight for him up until the end. And as, as much as it hurts me to relive it every day over and over again, I have to do it for him. I want to see him at home. I want to see Ariel, my brother-in-law. I want to see Arbel, and hopefully she's not being raped there. I want to see everyone back. And I was lucky to be released after 52 days. It's been far too long for them. And my mental state isn't good. It will take me years and years and the girls as well, to have to understand and process what we've been through at October 7th and all, during our captivity. But they're in much, there's, their state is much harder because it's been 150, and over 150 days and God knows how long it will take. So I thank you for listening to me. And I hope you can do everything you can in order to help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, it's very hard to speak after hearing your story. You are a brave you, a woman, and uh, we appreciate that you you uh, join our meeting. And we are here in order to speak up your story and pray that. David and Ariel and Arbel and the rest of the hostages will be released immediately. We'll be able to celebrate with you all. Thank you.